Hey there, want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters. And here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are available on Spotify as well. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for podcasters, I've been able to reach more listeners as well as start earning advertising revenue. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Hey there, how are you? I hope you are having an amazing day or evening. Today, we are going to be talking about compensation, so how it works and how it should work. (laughs) So stay with me. You are listening to the Career Talk Learn, Grow, Thrive podcast, where we talk about all things career related. I tell you how it is, and we get right to the point. I am your host, Stephanie Dennis. My background is in HR, which is what I have my master's degree in. This is a good time to mention this podcast does contain adult language. All right, compensation, how it works, and maybe how it probably should work. (laughs) So when we think about compensation, there are a lot of different components that make up a compensation package. So we, of course, have our cash compensation, which includes a base salary and or bonus. So base is usually a salary or an hourly rate, and then bonus, which of course not everyone has, but sometimes that is quarterly. Usually though, it's an annual bonus. Number two, some people and some companies will offer equity as part of their compensation package. So that could be stock options, it could be RSUs, or even employee stock purchase plans, which are a little bit different. The third component could be sign-on bonuses. Again, not everyone has these, but a lot of companies leverage them. And number four, benefits. So that is kind of what all rolls up under compensation or total rewards package. And all of the decisions that are made in each of those different components essentially make up what is a company's compensation framework. So let's look at how a framework works. Let's dive in here. So we have job families, and then we also have different levels within those job families. So Steph, what do you mean by that? So a job family is part of your compensation framework, and those different families are separated by job type. So for example, you could have all of the roles that fall under people or HR as one job family. You can have all of the roles that fall under engineering as one job family or product or marketing. So basically each team or department or uh, sometimes business unit, depending on how your company uses that term, have their own job family. So we understand families. Each department basically is its own job family. Within the job family or department, they also have their own jobs, which have their own job levels, right? So if we look at people or the HR team, we have talent acquisition, we have HR business partners, we have HR generalists, you may have compensation part of the team. So there's a lot of different roles or functions within the family. And then each function has its own level. So let's look at recruiting, right? So someone may start out in recruiting as a recruiting coordinator, and then they are promoted to a recruiter or sourcer. And then from there, maybe they'll go on to be a talent acquisition manager, then talent acquisition director, and then maybe VP of talent acquisition, so on and so forth, right? The job family is HR. The job itself is is recruiting and the different levels are coordinator, recruiter, sourcer, manager, director, so on and so forth. So it's kind of a tier, right? So if we look at each job within a job family, within a function, like within a particular role, and then within that particular role, a very specific job. So let's say recruiting coordinator is part of the HR function, that recruiting coordinator is going to have its own salary range unique to recruiting coordinator. Each job 
should have. (laughs) I say should because not all companies have this framework and the range is developed yet. Each job should have its own salary range. So how do we get to a specific salary range? Because salary ranges are vastly different depending on what company you're talking to. And sometimes it's a really broad range and sometimes it's a really narrow range. So stuff like how the hell do y'all come up with that? Let me tell you, each company is different and it depends on what their framework and their strategy that they decided that they want to take to compensation. So A lot of companies do market analysis. They listen to what people are expecting when they do interviews. They look at supply and demand, right? So if there is a ton of jobs open for this particular role and not a whole lot of people to fill it, that gives us a candidate market. If there is only a few positions open, but a ton of people looking for that job, that's more of an employer market. And then companies also participate in what are called salary surveys. So basically you can do market analysis and market research and go in and find uh, market data. So what other companies have reported on paying their people with this type of experience at this particular level. However, usually in order to get access to that data, you have to input your information as well. And that's called a salary survey. We take a lot of different factors into consideration when we want to come up with a salary range. We also factor in budget, right? So sometimes a role may have a really, really large range, but maybe a company has a smaller range for their particular role because of budgetary constraints. So again, a lot of different factors. And then we take that range and we break it down a little bit further. So usually there's a min- So a minimum we're going to pay for this role, a midpoint, which is usually the target, and then a max. So the very max someone's going to pay for the role. And this exact range is determined based on how you want to pay. So if you do your market research and the research comes back and says paying at the 50th percentile, so companies who are paying the top 50%, maybe that's $50,000. Let's do easy math. And then let's say 25% would be, what is that? I don't know. Well, just obviously not easy math. (laughs) So let's say that's 40,000, right? But then the top 75 percentile is paying at 60,000. Between 25 and 75%, you have a 20K spread. Uh, Some companies will literally use 25 is the min, 50 is the midpoint, and then the 75th percentile as their max. Other companies may come out and make the decision of saying, hey, we want to recruit, hire, and retain the best of the best. So we're going to make the decision to pay within the 80 to 90th percentile. That means you're paying at the top end amongst 80 to 90% of all the people who have completed the survey, right? So you're really, if you're an employer paying at 80 to 90, 100%, you're very competitive right? You are paying your folks the most. I mean, that typically is going to yield a higher quality. And generally, if you're going to pay at the top end of market, you're also going to be able to be a little bit more picky. We have ranges and those ranges are divided into the percentiles that people want to be paying at. And that's where those ranges typically are coming from. If people have done the proper amount of research, right? So just because one company is paying 40 to 50,000 for one role and another company is paying 60 to 70,000 for the exact same role, it doesn't mean that either company is doing something wrong. It simply may mean maybe they're both looking at the same data, but that company that's paying higher has decided we want to be the most competitive. We want to be as competitive as possible while staying within budgetary constraints. It may also mean that maybe one company offers like a really good bonus and the company that's paying higher offers no bonus, right? So maybe they're trying to compensate for that lack of bonus by offering higher base salary. So a lot of factors come into play. um, And I know without kind of like doing a whiteboard session with you guys, it's kind of hard to explain, but hopefully that makes sense. So we have job family, we have the job role, and then we have different levels within that job role. And then all of that is taken to figure out what should the numbers be. And those numbers are usually based on all of those different data points I provided. And then the company just making the ultimate decision of what percentage they want to pay at. So hopefully that makes sense. And one of the things that is pretty commonly misunderstood is that all levels within an organization have to have the same pay. And while at some companies they have decided that's true, majority of companies that is not true. So a manager of, let's say, customer service is going to have a very drastically different compensation salary range than, let's say, engineering manager. So it's going to be 
very different based on the job family and the role itself. So what should be more of a tiered scale, right, is within a particular job family and then within a particular role or function, the progression from, let's use our same example, recruiting manager to sourcer or recruiter and then to let's say a recruiting lead and then recruiting manager and then recruiting director or talent acquisition people use, you know, the words the same or interchangeably. So that should be progressive from each level, right? Each level, there should be an increase to that midpoint. So if people are moving up right? They're going to be uh, getting a decent, I don't want to say significant, but a decent increase to make those extra responsibilities, right? Worth it. However, that's not to say a VP of talent acquisition is going to be making the same as a VP of engineering. Now, what typically is the same across the different levels is the bonus and the equity, right? So generally speaking, individual contributors may have, let's just use an example, we'll do 5%. So if you are hired as a recruiter or a software engineer or a project manager and you're not managing anyone, no one is reporting to you, so you're an individual contributor, everyone at the IC level may be getting, let's say, a 5% bonus, right? Maybe equity is 5,000, just give a random number. And then maybe if you go to a manager, you're going to have a 10% bonus and maybe 7,000 in equity, right? Maybe that director, you get 15% bonus and 10,000 in equity. And then a VP, maybe it's a 25% bonus and 20,000 in equity. So it should be pretty consistent from a bonus perspective based on level. However, not consistent (laughs) for salary ranges. And I've heard people who are at a manager level finding out, oh, my colleague of a different job family, right, or a different function or manager in a different department is making, you know, $20,000 more than me and they get really upset. And like being someone who works in this world, (laughs) trying to explain it to them, like I understand why they're upset. They don't understand how it works, right? So hopefully that doesn't make anyone upset make you mad. It just simply, as you guys know, if you're listening to the podcast for a decent amount of time, you know I like to be as transparent as possible. I think a lot of people feel like HR is full of secrets and it's really not. I think it's just understanding where some of these things come from. But if your HR team is doing what they're supposed to do or your people team, so HR and people, same thing, usually. (laughs) I haven't come across a team where people doesn't equal HR, but I'm sure it's out there. So I'll say usually there should be a lot of transparency around things like this if the questions are asked, right? And sometimes I just think that it can be intimidating to be like, hey, HR peeps, what's up? Why? why? What you doing over there? You know, <laughs> so so you can come here and listen to me tell you all this good information, tell you random stories. We go down fun tangents, different rabbit holes, and we come out better, hopefully. <laughs> So anyway, I hope you guys found this podcast uh, episode helpful, valuable. If there's a topic you want me to cover, definitely reach out. Let me know. As always, thank you so much for taking the time to be here, to listen, to support the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, You guys can support the show simply by listening, sharing with a friend, leaving a review and or rating, and then of course, monetarily at PayPal or Anchor as well. All of that information is below. You can find me on the socials, StephDennis13, on Instagram and TikTok clubhouse just stuff dennis and then instagram career talk podcast as well we are written produced hosted and edited by yours truly you are so amazing so wonderful i hope you have a fantastic lovely rest of your day